So good evening again, and welcome to Connected Mothers. We're at part three. This series was supposed to be based on, it still is, based on the 12 principles of energized living that are discussed and elaborate on, described in the book, Your Awesome Self. It was about bringing those same ideas in the book, Your Awesome Self, to practical guidance in how we can use them in parenting. Um, last week, based on feedback, and I really, really appreciate the feedback, based on feedback, it seems that last week's class was an information overload and not practical enough. And I really appreciate the feedback and the questions because that's what make this, that's really what makes this group stronger and more meaningful for everyone. So thank you to the people who shared that. And what we're gonna do today is we're gonna get off the original plan. I'm getting off that train of like needing to cover you know, a couple of those principles in a, in a short amount of time, we're gonna, I'm throwing that uh, agenda out. We're gonna slow down and backtrack a bit. And um, what we're gonna do today is first of all, we'll summarize and clarify last week's message. And while we do that, we're going to answer the big question that a few different people asked, which is we are talking about giving our children, relating to our children with unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. And people have asked, how can I give my child unconditional love when I don't have that? I don't know how. I don't know how to do that for myself. I certainly don't know how to do that for my child. How can I give someone something that's not in my pack, that's not in my box? I don't have it. So that's our agenda for today. But first, I wanna start with a parenting victory that somebody shared. Here's um, today's experience that said a mother writes. Okay, so as I was getting my son ready for school, he started complaining that his pants are too short. And he started yelling at me that he already told me a million times and it's horrible pants and I should have bought him the pants and I didn't. Now, I think we could all relate to that example, right? <laughs> Our kids, when they don't have what they need and they yell at us. A few weeks ago, I would have probably started responding to his words. I would tell him, we don't talk this way to a mother and there's nothing wrong with your pants and don't, don't worry about it. And I will get you pants and stop screaming and stop, you know, da, da, da. When I get to it, I would, it would have been an argument on his level is basically what she's saying. But with the renewed awareness to listen to the emotions and the message, I said something like, you really wish you had different pants. You don't like these. I calmly continued helping him zipper his pants. I kissed him. I wish I kissed him and wished him a good day with warm wishes. What a different experience. What a different experience. Amazing. P.S. She wrote later in the day, I actually did get him the pants that he needed. Um, nothing like reminders from the kids for what we need to do for them. Okay. So thank you to the mommy, to the wonderful mommy, to the mommy of the lucky children who shared this experience. I really, really appreciate it. I wanna talk about it for one minute. The tool that she used in this experience was something we talked about in week number one, in part one of the series, which is to respond to our child's neediness and try not to get stuck in the words. Her child was complaining and fetching, And instead of arguing about what, why he was wrong for doing that, she validated the emotion. She got into, she, she empathized with him. She kept the calm by just, you know, just keeping calm instead of getting into that whirlwind of negativity um, and right at the energy level where he was. What a beautiful send off to school that child had. And it's such a gift because, um, and here's something else about the gift. You know, the person who shared before we started the recording actually did something very similar. Somebody, you know, her, her mother got a new couch and was complaining about the couch. And instead of saying, oh, we shouldn't complain and giving her a whole speech, she just said, how about we just sit for a little bit? Let's just sit a little bit on it. Let's just be, in, be on it for a little bit. And quietly just doing that, all of a sudden the energy shifted and there was joy and gratitude instead of negative complaining and arguing. Um, so this is something that we can give our children and it's definitely also something we can give ourselves and to the old people in our lives. And I think it is a good idea 
to practice it on ourselves because anything that we want to give our children, we want to practice on our own selves. And that also goes back, you know, it's in the theme of today's question, which is how can I give my child something that I don't have? We could give it to ourselves as well. Not we could, we need to give it to ourselves. Here's how, for example, here's how we can do this for ourselves. The same tool that the mother did for her child. We can do this for ourselves. When you find yourself feeling angry, frustrated with other people or with things that are happening outside of you, things that are beyond your control, feeling that heat coming up, you're getting angry, you're venting, you're raw, you're, you're starting to get very upset. Don't start arguing with yourself. I think that's what we usually do right away. We start arguing with ourselves. We start telling ourselves, don't, you know, pushing ourselves away. Don't, don't go there. Don't, don't feel that way. Don't be that way. Are you right? Are you wrong? Maybe, you, you know, people sometimes, a lot of times people say, here, I'm so angry. Am I right for being angry? Like, it's not about if you're right or wrong. It doesn't even matter. Instead, instead, turn the spotlight inward and ask yourself what you need right now. What would you like? Not what's wrong, not what other people did that's whatever they did that's not what they should have been doing. Not what rules were violated, but what would you like? What do you need? What, what do you want to happen right now? It's as simple as that, what would you like? And then listen without judgment. Just be there for yourself. Be there for yourself. Oh, you want a new shirt? Oh, this is your, you're upset that the floor, the floor you, you want to have uh, a, a clean floor, you want to relax a little. Once you're listening to what you need or want, and you just allow that desire to breathe, to just be without judgment, without knocking it down, without disqualifying it or arguing with it, the energy shifts from helplessness, despair, and negativity, that negative spiral to gentle, nurturing kindness. It's a huge shift. And, and then you could even see on a practical note, if this actual need is something or desire is something you could give, you could give to yourself, even if it's just in a small way. You can't have pants right now, you know, the mother told the boy, but later on in the day, she did get the pants, right? She did buy it. So another example where someone did this for herself is that a mother shared with me that she was very tired in the morning and she found herself feeling very irritable and annoyed at everyone and you know, snapping at everyone very, very quickly, very short tempered. And then she paused and she used this tool, this thing of just like turning the spotlight inward to her own needs and to what was going on inside of her. And she asked herself, what would you like? What would you like? How can I take care of you right now? And she realized what she would like is just to have an easier morning. She just wants it to be a little easier. And then she asked herself, well, what can I do for you to make it easier? And so she, this is a mother who usually, you know, makes scrambled eggs and toast or French toast or omelets or, you know, uh, a smoothie or something for, for breakfast. And she decided, you know what? I could just do cereal today. I could even pull out a piece of cake and give my kids a piece of cake for breakfast. I can do this. And she made it easier for herself. And she had a wonderful morning. So that's what this mother did for her kid. He was complaining, he was being unreasonable, he was yelling at her, he was, he was, he was do, speaking inappropriately, angrily, and that was unpleasant for her to hear. That's always unpleasant for us to hear. We don't like it when our kids tell us how bad we are, how wrong we are, how inadequate we are. We know ourselves how inadequate we are. We don't need anyone else to tell it to us, especially when we're working so hard, trying to do so many different things for, and, you know, take, taking good care of all that is involved in taking care of our kids. So this mother could have easily jumped right into that muddy puddle of arguing with her son about why he should not be saying what he was saying. But instead of jumping into that puddle or getting pulled into that puddle where her son was standing, she went into her mother puddle, her, her, her mother's shoes, I should say, her motherly awareness and her motherly wisdom and her motherly choice, that, that ability to choose consciously and to engage from a place of connection instead of distraction. From the place of her mother's shoes, her mother wisdom, her mother insight, she responded to what he needs and gave him that gentle, loving send off to school. Okay, 
So that was today's moment of choice. And as you go through your week, you're going to have many opportunities, many, many, many opportunities to slip and slide and get pulled into those muddy puddles of despair, helplessness, anger, frustration, negativity, blame, arguments, threatening, bribing. It's, it's going to happen. And if you only take one thing out of all our six weeks of learning, let it be this. Every single moment is a moment of choice. Every single moment is a moment of choice to continue being in that muddy puddle of all that stuff that leads nowhere or to take one step out, you know, one step out of that place of distraction, one step, step out, one step in to our mother shoes, our a place of awareness, a place of conscious choice um, and our, our true values of connection and, and nurturing the relationship right in front of, right, right, like in front of our consciousness. So please share with me when you have such a moment so I can share it with the group. Um, share it with Sterna at energizedliving.org. I really appreciate it. Or leave us a message on the general, um, the Energized Living phone, 718-576-0338. Um, we would love, I would love to be able to share that, to share your personal moment of choice with the group. Okay. So like we said in the beginning, we are doing the 12 principles of energized living. That's that's, our, that's what we're here for today, to do the 12 principles of energized living as they relate to parenting. Last week, we talked about principle number one, and what we're going to do now is summarize and, and, and explain it, hopefully, a little bit more clearly, and I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes, and then we'll pause for questions. Okay, so principle number one is Taira, Siva, Lanu, Maisha, Mayrasha, Kehila, Siaka, the Taira that Maisha commanded to us is the inheritance of every single one of us. It's our personal inheritance. So how does this, what, what is this in general? So in the book, we talk about how as human beings, as people who live in a mundane practical world, we naturally value things that we could see and touch and feel. We naturally value the external dimension of reality, what things look like on the outside. And the Torah invites us to value the deeper truth, the truth about Hashem, the inside story, to see reality through the lens of Hashem's reality, through the lens of Hashem being true and Hashem being real and the part of Hashem within us being true and being real. That is the gift of Torah. Torah gives us Hashem. Torah saves us from living on the outside of reality. And in practical terms, what it does actually is, what does it look like to live on the outside of reality? when we don't have awareness of the inside story, when we don't have awareness of Hashem, when we do not have awareness of who we really are, it's say, we, we get stuck. We feel helpless, we feel lonely, we're anxious, we, we're filled with fear in a world that's operated by random powers, by money, by society, by random rules, um, that we have no real sense of security and strength. We have nowhere to get real security from. So the Torah invites us to a world that is 100% secure. It's 100% operated by Hashem himself. And that's why this first principle is some, this is the first principle that we want to live by. That's really everything. Everything else is commentary. As people, we forget that Hashem is running the world. We really, we, we forget. We get swept up in a mindset that, it, that denies, ignores, um, Hashem that rejects Hashem, that, dis that we are distracted from Hashem, not because we're bad people, just because we're people, just because that's how the world operates. And that's where we live. And from there, we get into those muddy pits of helplessness, of intense neediness, of loneliness, anxiety, and fear, and unhealthy dependencies. That's really not good for us. But so our first principle that we want to do is to align our beliefs with Hashem's truth, with Hashem's reality. In every situation we are in, we want to become aware of what we're thinking and just rewind and adjust our perspectives to include Hashem and to be aligned with Hashem's truth. But how does this all relate to parenting? All of that was a summary of what we talk about in the book. 
Okay. How does all of this relate to parenting? How does it help me be the mother that I want to be? How does it make my house be a more calm, secure, loving place? It's like this. Just like we naturally get stuck on the outside of reality and we forget the inside where Hashem is actually running the show, just like we do that in general, it's the same story with parenting. We get stuck on the outside and we lose sight of the inside. What do I mean is that as parents, we tend to focus much more of what our kid is doing on the outside, on our child's behavior, than on our relationship with the child. We focus on controlling and, 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 and um, you know, controlling the behavior as opposed to nurturing the relationship because our relationship is not something we could see and touch. It's deeper. It's deeper. It's, it's beyond what we could see and touch. It's not in front of our face. The child's behavior is visible to us. It's measurable. The quality of our attachment is not visible and it's not measurable. And in that sense, it's much, much more powerful. But because we don't see it and because we can't measure it, we, we not only forget that it's more powerful we, and, and important and impactful, we forget about it totally. We forget how important it is and we forget that it is, that it's there. And instead we tend to focus much more on the behaviors. And what that looks like in a very practical way is that if my kid is crying, my goal becomes get him to stop crying. Let me get him to be calm. Instead of let me see how this experience, how this moment of disappointment and frustration and overwhelm is going to be a moment of teaching, a moment of connection, a moment where he is going to grow with something valuable on the inside. Okay? I wanna get the tantrum to stop. I wanna get him to look good on the outside. We naturally do not pay enough attention to what's happening on a deeper level on the inside of the relationship and on the inside of a child's heart and mind. Like what are they thinking on a deeper level? And this is true, especially because we're so busy. We have so much to get done in one day, in one night. And many of us, Baruch Hashem, are blessed with multiple children, not just multiple responsibilities outside the home, but multiple children with inside the home. And especially, you know, and, and that's, you know, I don't need to tell you, you know, right? How busy you are and how overwhelmed and how tired. At every stage and age, we tend to care more about the process than more about the product than the process. We care about what the child is doing on the outside more than how the child is doing on the inside. And again, I'm validating the difficulty because we just have to get through the day. We just have to get everyone into bed. We just have to get it done, right? And so that's, that's what seems to matter. But the truth is that, that that's not the truth. The truth is that the inside is so much more important than the outside, right? It's not that as long as I got the kid to behave, as long as the kid moved on with their day, got out the door, got their homework done, got through the back, got to sleep, then all is good, right? It's not that. Yeah, we should feel good when things are running smoothly because it's a nice, it's a blessing when things in our house are, are running smoothly, but there's so much more to our person than what we see on the outside. And there's so much more to our child than what we see on the outside. And if we keep focusing only on the external stuff, only on what's going on, the good grades, the good looks, the obedience, the conformity, the you know following all expectations and not doing anything different, if all that matters to us on a practical level every day, is that our child behaves and says and does what we want them to say and do. And we avoid confrontations. We cannot tolerate any tears or any messy emotions or temper tantrum. We have no time for deep emotional needs. That's how our parenting becomes a series of threats and bribes and controlling instead of encouraging, supporting, teaching, and most importantly, through it all, connecting. And that's how our relationship, chas v'shalom, could go out the window and we are left with chas v'shalom nothing. In Rahman al-Lutzlan, we are left with more and more children being lost. It's not because of anything other than a lack of attachment, a lack of real nurtured connection, because there's only so far that threats 
and bribes and controlling can go. Ultimately, what holds us together is not the good grades. What holds us together with our children is not the fact that they got good grades. It's not the fact that they have good looks. It's not even the fact that they behave very nicely. It's only, only, only our relationship. It's our attachment, it's our connection. And so we need to really nurture that connection. I wanna pause here for a minute for, to see if there's any questions on the chat. You can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. And after that, we will um, continue. Okay, that's a great question. The question is, how do I, 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 I get that I want to nurture my relationship with my child, but I also want them to behave. I don't want them to be yelling at me. I want them to stop yelling. So the question is, what am I gonna do about that, right? I want both. I want the relationship and I want them to stop yelling. So I think in every moment, you know, it's about what matters more. What matters more? Does the relationship matter more or does it, does it matter more that he stops yelling? I wanna tell you what I think. If you, you know, if we, if we, if we visit the streets, okay? And ask any random teenager who's on the street corners, if it's right or wrong to yell, they all know. They all know exactly that it's not okay to yell in a house. Not one of them is going to say that it's perfectly fine and healthy to yell. They know what to do. There's something that's getting in their way of not doing what they know is right. And it's got nothing to do with their lack of knowledge. So I could tell my kid don't yell, but they already know not to yell. They know not to yell. There's a reason they're yelling. And that reason is something we want to address. Much more importantly than the fact that they're yelling. Obviously, you don't want to um, demonstrate a complete, you know, you don't want to have a, a house that's totally, everyone do whatever you want. It's all okay. It's not about if it's right or wrong. It's about how am I going to teach them instead of control them. And to teach instead of control, we need understanding, we need conversations, we need a real nurturing approach. So let's say a kid is screaming. We don't wanna tell them stop screaming because then we're also screaming over their voice, right? What we wanna do is maybe hold them. Maybe just hold them, maybe just pick them up and hold them if they're a little one. And maybe, meet them at eye level if they're a bigger one and say, whoa, I see that you're really upset. I hear you. I hear you. You're really upset. You really don't like this. And all of a sudden the energy shifts because you can't really be angry at somebody who's being nice to you. How long could you be angry at someone who's being nice to you? It's hard, right? So somebody's asking a question, what if I would like, um, when I ask myself what I would like, what if what I would like is that another person in my life should be nicer to me and should not be abrupt and rude to me? So that's a, that's a big deal. You know, that's, that's, that's not something you could give yourself because you can't control other people. You could say, you could go over to that person and say, hey, I would like something from you, right? But I, I, would, I would imagine that if you're asking this question, you already asked them, you already had a conversation with them. You already pointed out that you're hurt by these comments and you, are, you asked in a, in a healthy, meaningful, productive way. You're like, I would appreciate if you talk to me like this instead of like that. So then what you have is a, is a feeling of pain. You know, I would like to have more love. I would like to be treated nice. And then you could give yourself a hug or share with somebody, share your experience with somebody who can support you through that difficulty. Someone's asking, what if my children are older and I did not do all of this? I wish I did, but they're much older now. Any way to improve the relationship? I wanna say that, yes, it's never too old. Nobody is too old for love. Nobody is too old for nurturing. Every single adult that I know really, really needs a mother in their life to be accepting, to be nurturing, to be loving and supportive. And it's never too late to give that to our children. 
it's hard to differentiate between connection and functionality. Like everyone has to get dressed and make it to the bus. There's always gonna be a balance. Everyone has to get dressed and make it to the bus. What's more important? What's more important? Is it more important that the kid should make it to the bus? Or am I gonna, you know, I wanna tell you something. In my own personal life, I was able to maybe have them miss the bus and then drive them to school. But maybe for some people that doesn't work. But even if it doesn't work, maybe you had to scream or you had to really threaten and, 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 and you know, <clears throat> be more controlling and more forceful than you want to just to get the kid out the door. But think about what just happened. And when the child comes home, come up with a different plan so that that doesn't happen again. And if a child is more sensitive and needs more time and needs a slower pace, we have to, we have to be proactive about that. Maybe by preparing more stuff in the night before, maybe by waking up a little bit earlier so that we have more time. Maybe by us going to sleep a little earlier if we can. Maybe by us letting go of certain standards that are not as important as giving the child that love. So I don't think we have to give up functionality for connection. I just think we have to make a connection more of a priority than functionality. And that doesn't mean that we never put functionality first, but we always come back to connection. And if we're compromising connection on a regular basis, we wanna take a step back and see what can I do? What can I do to fix this? What can I do to put connection first so that I don't have to compromise it every single morning again and again and again and again. I love that. That is, that's beautiful. That is such a great idea. Can I share that in your name? Okay, so I wanted to share that. So somebody on this call, Mermudis Kessler, is sharing a fantastic tool that actually addresses this very issue of how we can nurture and set limits at the same time. Because children, of course, need limits. Of course they need limits. And they're going to push against the limits and they need us to hold them. But they need us to hold them lovingly and with the clarity that this is about their good and their growth, not about us being having being in a bad mood or us having a random, you know, a random rule that we just pulled out of our sleeve that doesn't even make any sense. So it's about being consistent, um, communicating clear limits and guides, rules of the house that the family has at family meetings, at times when you can have proactive conversations. But what Mermuda shared now is such a great tool and she calls it the love sandwich, which a love sandwich, I love it. It's a great sandwich. Um, she says she does connect, direct, and then connect. Connect meaning when a child is upset or doing something inappropriate, breaking a rule, um, but clearly also upset. First, she connects with them by validating their emotion. Then she gives a direction of what limits are expected now. We are not going to be hitting. We are not throwing. We are staying inside. We are whatever it is. We are having safe hands right now. Whatever the rule is. So first there's a connection, then there's a direction, and then it's again a connection. Please tell me what's bothering you. I want to hear. I love it. Thank you so much, Mermudis. That was so helpful. That's an excellent question. And somebody actually um, sent in that question. I was going to do it next week, but let's talk about it now for a minute and then we're going to do it more next week. So that was very well said. I actually took notes while you said it so that I could, um, I could repeat it. Um, so here, here's the question. In this world of so much information with constant, you know, there's so many Jewish magazines that have all these articles about, you know, what we should do, what we shouldn't be doing. And what causes trauma and what causes dysfunction later in life and emotional uh, illness and all that. So much information, it makes me worried. I find myself talking a lot about my children all day. When does it become too much? When does that, that focus on what I need to do right become wrong in itself just because it's so anxiety ridden? Um, and it's such an important question because somebody, somebody else said it in a different way. Somebody else said, 
um, is it too much to focus on the connection? And then when I asked, you know, what does that mean? I explain, she said, well, I'm worried. So here's the thing. We're not talking about, this is not actually a parenting class. Sorry, if anybody thought it's a parenting class, it's a mistake. It's not really a parenting class. It's about how connecting to Hashem and making Hashem the center of our lives and anchoring ourselves within the reality where Hashem is true, how does that help us as we parent our children? I don't, I, I wanna, I, I wanna, the reason why I'm getting stuck on the difference there and nitpicking is, is because of this. Fear of what's gonna be tomorrow is definitely part of the notion that we could control what's going to be tomorrow. Ultimately, we have no control of what, uh, what the outcome of our chinuch is. You can do the best and something beyond your control goes wrong in your child's life and it has nothing to do with you. Every child's story is written by HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself. Every child has a destiny, a journey that's planned directly by Hashem without our help and without our, we don't write the script. All we have to do is show up and do our part and our best. So that's why I, wanna, I wanted to you know, clarify that what we're talking about is anchoring ourselves within that mindset where Hashem is true. Once we're coming from that place, we're not, our goal here is not to be the best mothers we can be, to have the best kids on the block. That's not our goal because to, to do that, you can, there's many books out there. There's a hundred thousand books out there and there's a uh, hundred other parenting courses that you could join for how to have the best kids and the best outcome you could possibly have. That's not what we are here for in this group. In this group, we're here to understand and to explore and to incorporate the benefits of how grounding ourselves within Hashem's reality brings more peace, love, and connection, and practical goodness into our lives, including our lives, and in this, in this group, especially our lives as mothers. So in the place where we trust Hashem for the, out, we, we, you know, there's a Hasidic expression that says, mir darf in tan de right? Um, I, I apologize if, if you don't understand my Yiddish. It's a different Yiddish. We do our best and Hashem does what's, Hashem does the rest. Or somebody once said, it, we do what's right and Hashem does what's left, right? We, we do our part, only Hashem gets it done. With that in mind, I don't think it's ever too much to think about our children, but the minute we're in a place of worry, the minute we're in a place of anxiety, that is, we have lost, we have lost sight of our anchor. We have lost sight of what we're in this for and what our actual role is. Our role is not controller. Our role is Hashem's daughter do, taking care of Hashem's children. Okay, that's, that's our role. We're not the controller. We're not the one in charge of our child. We're actually babysitting our child for Hashem. If I can, if I dare um, use that word, we don't, he, he doesn't belong to me. He belongs to Hashem. And all I have to do is do my best to take care of him with the tools that I have, with the resources that I have, with the awareness that I have. And, and that's all. And I let go of the results. Once we have Hashem in the picture and we're hired by Hashem, we're workers. We're not the boss. I'm not responsible for the bottom line of my company. Hashem is responsible for the bottom line of my company. I just have to do my part. I have to do the best that I could do. So huge, 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 huge shift. There is no room for anxiety. And yeah, we all worry. What I wanna suggest is to turn that worry into a prayer. Turn that worry into a tefillah. Hashem, please give this child the wisdom, the courage, the strength to da 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 Please protect this child as they go through their day. Please keep him safe as he crosses the street for the very first time. 
Turn every moment of anxiety into a tefillah. Why? Two things. First of all, a tefillah is always helpful. It shifts the energy from negative to positive. And it more on a deeper level, it brings Hashem into our picture. It grounds us in the reality where we realize we're actually not in charge. Hashem is in charge. It practically does that, what we say in Tehillim, Hashleich al Hashem yehavacha Cast your burden on Hashem and he will sustain you. And he does sustain you. So just to get back to the question, information could be, could be overloaded. It could be if we think we are in control. We're not in control. We, our only job is to do the best that we can with the tools that we have. Um, and, and, and we're not in control. And so I, I, I don't know. I hope, that was, I hope that's helpful on some level. Okay, so the question is, um, we're talking about the tool of turning our worries and anxieties into a prayer. How can I do that without feeling like a victim of Hashem's will? When Hashem's will very likely might not be what I want. I think the only way to do that is to really trust that Hashem's will is, in, is for our good. And I know that that's very, 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 very hard. And it's not something that you wake up to one morning. The process of doing that is really thinking about Hashem every day um, and, and, and reminding ourselves, you know, look at your own life. And yeah, there were things that had to happen that were negative. I don't know who I'm speaking with, but I know just because I'm speaking to a human being uh, that's an adult that I am sure there were many times in your life that things that happened that were not pleasant. And you could, and you have a choice to look at it like, you know, I, I'll never forget, I, I, I was walking down the stairs of my house and I tripped over a, uh, over a step and I fell, I went flying flat. I landed flat on my face. And my first thought was, Baruch Hashem, I am safe. Thank you, Hashem. <laughs> Thank you, Hashem. I am safe. I am. Thank you. I was so grateful that like I didn't break anything. I didn't even break my phone, even though it went flying. My glasses didn't break. My I, I had a class that day and I didn't get any scrapes. I was hurt and I got black and blue marks. I was shaken up, but nothing scraped. And afterwards, I was thinking what a blessing it is to be able to have that attitude because many times instead of saying, thank you, Hashem, I would be like, oh, shucks, why did that have to happen? And why did I, why did I have to fall? And why did I, you know, why did I get stuck? And, you know, how come that terrible thing happened to me and, and all that? It was a blessing in that moment to accept that for whatever reason that I don't understand, I needed to fall. And even though I had to fall, Hashem was there for me, saving me and, and keeping me safe. And I think that trusting Hashem is, is the only way that, that we could get to that place. And I think about so many, you know, the, the, the story that comes to my mind, and I apologize that this is uh, a little bit going off on a tangent, but my father was in the hospital during COVID for four weeks. He was in the hospital ultimately for five weeks, but after four weeks, he was desperate to come home. And he was having a conversation with me and my sister on the phone. We were both on the phone with him. And he was explaining to my sister and I how he's going to work it out and how he's going to get help. And he won't be too much of a burden on anyone. And, um, and he'll take care of himself. And he'll da 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 And how it's all going to work out. And very gently, my sister explained to him that the doctors were not letting him go home. He, he really still needed that extra support of oxygen that he was getting at home at, in the hospital that we did or whatever it was that he was getting at in the hospital the cure that he was getting that was just not possible to provide at home and i'll never forget for a long moment he was quiet when it hit him because this conversation was a good seven minutes back and forth i mean on the clock right it felt much longer but a good few minutes and afterwards he was quiet for a long minute and then he said Gamzula Taiva. And as he said those words, Gamzula Taiva, there was like his voice was thick with emotion. And I could feel 
that it took work for him to say, you know what? I accept God's plan. I accept Hashem's plan for me. And, and I get it. I get it. I get it that this is Hashem's will and I accept it. And, and, and to be able to do that took a lifetime of, of trusting Hashem. And I think that's the only way we could feel like a, a child being taken care of rather than a victim being thrown around. But it's not something that happens overnight. And please do not beat yourself up for feeling this way. I think it's very normal to feel this way, especially since many bad things happen in the world many times, right? Things that, I mean, you know, things that are clearly very painful. There's so much pain, there's so much brokenness. So why should I trust the one who created all this pain and all this brokenness? And yet we trust because that's that's how, that's because ultimately we, what good would a Hashem be if we understood everything? He wouldn't be Hashem if we understood everything he did. The fact that we don't understand is part of what makes him our creator and our infinite creator, our limitless creator, the one who we cannot understand. And just accepting that is very, very helpful. You're going to have to keep coming back to it again and again and again and again. But ultimately, the more we trust Hashem, the more we could feel protected and loved instead of, um, you know, instead of victimized. Thank you for that. That was an excellent question. I, I really appreciate it. it. There's there's one other example here that I could share that um, that actually my daughter told me about her two-year-old. She has a two and a half year old. Need it, it, this is an example. The reason why I'm sharing this story it's beca is because it's an example where Nurturing a connection does not have to come at the cost of setting limits or of getting the child to do something. It's just a matter of putting that connection into the equation. So her two-year-old needed to take medicine and he refused. You want to take medicine? No. Here's, here's your medicine. No. He runs away. He's not interested in taking the medicine. So she was about to go check what kind of nosh she has available in her cabinet she was gonna bribe her kid and promise him a candy or whatever it was so that he would take that medicine, promise him a prize, which is called in English, bribing, right? She does the bribing thing, not the threatening thing, okay? So her husband was there and he's like, hey, maybe try to explain it to him, like see what happens. And I, I would think a two-year-old, you're gonna explain this to a two-year-old that he needs to take medicine, but she's brave and she decided to give it a try she picked the kid up onto her lap. She picked her boy, her son, onto her lap, held him, looked into his eyes. And you know, he's calm. They're having a conversation. And, she's, and she explained to him, you don't feel well, right? And your boo-boo, you have a boo-boo in your mile, your boo-boo, you your throat hurts you, right? It hurts a lot. Remember, we went to the doctor. Remember, we went to the doctor. Remember, the doctor said that if you take this medicine that tastes icky, it does not taste good. If you take it a few times, it's going to help the boo-boo go away and Hashem is going to make you feel all better. Isn't that a great idea? She explained it to him. She asked him then, isn't that a great idea? And he nodded. And he's like, okay, let's do this. Let's take the medicine. And I, 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 he's two and a half years old and she was able to explain this to him. I think the only reason why she was able to explain it to him is because obviously Baruch Hashem, he has intelligence. But I don't think it's that, just that. Every kid has intelligence. We need to have those conversations. It's so much easier to go get the nosh in the nosh, in the nosh cabinet. It's so much easier to bribe and threaten and control and hold the kid down and give them the medicine. And sometimes we need to do that. I'm not gonna deny it, okay? Sometimes we do need to do that. At the end of the day, we need to pick up the child and walk out the door of the doctor's office or of the toy store because it's not a good time to have a conversation. It's not the time, it's not the space to have a conversation. But, you know, and, and life goes on. But when this parenting style is repeated again and again and again, what's left? It doesn't work in the bigger picture. It just doesn't work. It does the opposite of what we want on so many layers. That's a great question, by the way, to ask a child. What can I do to help you help yourself? What can I do to help you help yourself calm down? What can I do to help you wake up or do what you need to do? 
what can I do to help you get your home, you know, to help you get your homework done? Because that, like that, what you're doing is you're putting him in charge or her in charge. And it's, 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 you're there as the facilitator, as the coach, as the supportive teacher, not the control freak. So thank you so much for sharing that. I want to just go back to the question and what, um, and, and, and what somebody else shared before is that what if I have that conversation with my child and, and they agree to take the medicine and, and then when push comes to shove, they refuse. And so somebody else shared that, um, that, yeah, but even though still, as long as you had the conversation, then that act of control where you actually have to, you know, push them to get, to take that medication on a two year, two and a half year old, you just, you have, you'll hold them down. You'll give them that medication. Um, but your whole time as you're doing it, you're saying, we remember we said we need to, we need to do this. And it doesn't become that intense negative energy. You're still being positive in your tone of voice and you still explain it. And the story that you're writing in his head, even after the fact is like, it was really hard for you to take it. And I, I, I hated that I had to force you, but I really, you needed that medicine. You know, somebody's asking one more question. I want to take what, do this one more question and then we're going to wrap up. Sometimes I feel that when I focus so much on connection, I end up being too permissive. I could very much relate. And that's why we're talking, we're not talking about being totally only connection matters and limits don't matter. I remember the moment I had this insight as a parent that when I give my child limits, when I teach them boundaries, that is a very beautiful gift and an act of love. It's not being mean. It's not being obnoxious. It's not being cruel. I'm not getting in their way. I'm giving them a gift that they will treasure for the rest of their life. They need limits. They don't, they don't have the words to tell you that. They don't have the awareness to tell, you, to tell us that. But kids desperately need limits. And so I don't think that focusing on connection at all is a distraction from being permissive. What I want to say is that from the place of fear, if I'm afraid of losing the connection, then I will be permissive because I'm too afraid. But from the place of I want to give my child the connection, and there's a security that sometimes I, I also want to give him limits as part of that connection. It's part of my love for the child. I need him or her to have a sense of limits and a respect for other people and a sense of boundaries. Uh, from a place of fear, we do end up being more permissive than we want to because we're just afraid. But when we take the fear out of the picture, where we're not afraid of losing the connection, when our connection is a conscious choice and a gift, it goes in the same category as limits and it does not um, detract from it. I wanna just put out one thought. I wanna connect this to our original question and then we're gonna wrap up and we're gonna continue this Amir Tashem, next week. But our question was, how can I give my child unconditional love if I don't have it? And we talked about principle number one being to keep coming back to align our thoughts with Hashem's reality. The reality that Hashem is in charge of the world and Hashem is the ultimate value. And how, so, so, so what is unconditional love? Unconditional love is not possible. It's not possible for anybody without having a sense of what makes us unconditionally lovable. We need to know what makes us lovable. What makes you lovable? Is it the fact that you make good kakish cake? Is it the fact that you're pretty? Is it the fact that you get a lot of stuff done? Is it the fact that you know, you know how to make a good impression on other people? What makes you lovable? What makes you respectable? What makes you worthy of respect? What gives you value? Each and every one of us has many things about us that people like about us, that people need us for. But there's really only one thing that we have that gives us unconditional value. That means value, that's always valuable, even if other people don't like us, even if we fail, even if we face rejection, even if we experience any kind of loss or failure or mistakes, we still have this. It's unconditional, it's unstoppable, and nothing 
can diminish it. And that value is the fact that we have a part of Hashem within us. It's our neshama. It's that deeper level of reality. It's not anything we do. It's something that we are. It's not anything that we, you know, we can show or demonstrate. It's not a skill. It's just who we are. It's bigger than anything we could do. And we, none of us have that to perfection because we come to adulthood needing to work on that. That is our Avedis Sashem to value Hashem, to come to value Hashem. As, as children, we value candy. We value what we could see. We value pleasure. We value delight more than we value the truth. More than we value the inside, we value the outside. And so we all come to adulthood with false perceptions, mixed up perceptions of what makes me respectable, what makes me likable, what makes me a good person. I used to think, I'm a good person if I can get a lot done. I'm a good person if I can make people happy. If I can make people smile, that makes me a good person. Now, it's a good thing to make people smile, but that's not what makes me a good person. And if somebody's upset, it doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. I'm a good person because Hashem says so. And Hashem's word matters more than anything else in the world. So we all come to adulthood needing to do that work. And as we do that work, we can relate to our children from that place of awareness. And that's really the only way we could give them unconditional love. None of us, you know, some people have it more, have, 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 have had an easier childhood. Some people had a harder childhood. My guess is if that you suffered in your childhood and you were not unconditionally loved and you came to adulthood feeling a little bit worthless and feeling a little bit inadequate, most people that I know feel that way, but some people feel that way more than others. So then you need to do more work. We need to do more work. And, and, and it could be nothing to do with our parenting or the way we were parented. It could be that it's because of we're a much more sensitive soul. And we just internalize negativity on a whole different level. And we really, you know, wrote negative stories. I, I had an experience in my childhood where I, I remember saying a Pasuk Shema at a rally and when I was in third grade, which is when I was about nine, eight or nine years old. I, and for many, many years, I had this story in my head that I got up and I said, Shema, very loud. And then I said, Yisrael, Hashem, I, 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 from Shema to Yisrael, I dropped down to uh, almost a whisper. That was the story that for some reason I processed in my mind. And it became a narrative that influenced, like that I referred back to, oh, you see, I start projects and then I don't carry through with the same energy. Just like when I said that Pasuk, when I was in third grade, and I said, Shema, Yisrael, Hashem, Elikeinu, right? I dropped down my energy level. And for many years, I had that story about that experience when I was in third grade. And a couple of years ago, somebody sent me a recording of that rally where I was called up in front of the Lubavitcher Rebbe to say that Pasuk, Shema Yisrael, out loud for the whole crowd of children. And I heard myself say, Shema! Yisrael, hush, loud, every single word. I never dropped that key. It never happened. The story that I had been telling myself for so many years, the story that I believed never happened. And that's just one little example. You know, we all have stories about ourselves. We come into our adulthood with stories that might not even be true, but that the one thing they all have in common is that somehow we are inadequate. We are not lovable. We're not respectable. We're not good enough in some way or another. And the work that we need to do is to value Hashem, to really consciously attribute value to Hashem. How we do that, we can talk about more in Merz Hashem next week. But thinking about Hashem, um, even just saying my da'ani in the morning with consciousness, shakol when we say, when we, you know, a few times throughout the day, just thinking about what we're saying, Consciously giving value to Hashem and thinking about the value that we ourselves have as carriers of his light, as people that he trusts 
And as mothers, each of us is trusted. We are trusted. Hashem would never give you a child to take care of if he didn't think you could do it. He trusts you not just to carry to take care of yourself, but to take care of your child. It's an unbelievable empowerment. If we, when we value Hashem, we could really come to valuing ourselves and giving ourselves unconditional love. And so the one practical thing I want to leave off with today is going back to what we started off with, which is be kind to yourself. Talk to yourself nicely. Be aware of how you're talking to yourself. Talk to yourself the way you want to talk to your child in your best dreams. Talk that way to yourself. And then that language will become more of your language, will become more authentic for yourself. And it will become more, it will become more of a flow as you try to bring that into your parenting. I want to just say thank you again to everyone who joined during this week. For those of you who missed it in the beginning, if you have when you have a moment of choice and you make that conscious choice, please share it with me, sterna at energizedliving.org. I want to be able to share your story next week. Share your questions. We're going to do part two of this, which is how to how do we actually move from shame to worthiness as peer, you know, as individuals for ourselves. And um, how do we give that to our children? Um, looking forward to seeing you next week. Until then, have a wonderful, good Shabbos.